Well, welcome to the third lecture for HIH 227, HIL 227, Medieval Britain. Uh, this lecture is on uh, the so-called Scottish Wars. You'll see they're called the Scottish Wars of Independence. Uh, in some publications, that's a, a matter of interpretation, uh, depending on which side of the border you're from. There are a series of uh, points we might consider over the course of this lecture here. What was the nature of Anglo-Scottish relations around about 1250? Uh, uh, this is the, the beginning of our course period, of course, but uh, uh, of course it's a, a relatively peaceful time, uh, 1250. Number two, how and why did these relations change? Uh, what was the role of Edward I as an individual in creating various uh, bad situations, ultimately resulting in war? Uh, further down the road, the late 13th century. And number four, uh, I want you to think about the role of Scottish individuals like John Balliol, Robert Bruce, and uh, William Wallace. Uh, Wallace, of course, is the so-called brave heart, uh, now of incredibly inaccurate Hollywood fame. So this, of course, is the... Uh, famous Matthew Paris map uh, drawn up by the St. Albans uh, monk uh, in the uh, latter part of the uh, uh, 13th century. Uh, this uh, just, just to remind you of how, uh, from an English point of view, how Scotland is a, a wee bit of space bunged onto the top of, uh, bunged onto the top of England. But, but of course, as we know now with modern cartographic uh, uh, measuring techniques that obviously Scotland is a very large uh, chunk of real estate. And uh, that fundamental misunderstanding I think is quite important when we think about uh, basic things like uh, why do the English think that you'd be able to trundle an army all the way to the northern tip of Scotland uh, and back again uh, without undue difficulties in your supply chain. Anyway, those uh, considerations are further down the road. Uh, around about 1250, uh, there'd no, been no war between the English and the Scots since uh, 1217. Uh, the border was uh, um, you know, pretty much settled from uh, uh, kind of Solway in the west coast, uh, stretching across uh, to uh, uh, Berwick uh, on Tweed. And uh, Berwick, of course, was part of Scotland uh, at that period. It, it, Berwick would remain part of Scotland until the uh, so-called uh, Anglo-Scottish uh, Wars or Scottish Wars of Independence at the end of the 13th century. There were uh, close, uh, fairly uh, friendly official ties between the English and the Welsh. Keep in mind that just as the, uh, the Norman conquerors had come into England, uh, uh, you know, uh, William of Normandy and all of his crew, and a lot of Normans had settled in England. In fact, some Normans had settled in southern lowland Scotland as well, where they'd been invited in by the the uh, kings of Scotland and had uh, really pretty peacefully integrated. So there are a lot of persons who have property on both sides of the Anglo-Scottish border in the mid-13th century. Uh, maybe the, the sort of final uh, peaceable event between the uh, English king and the Scottish king took place uh, following the Anglo-Welsh War of 1277, when Prince of Wales Llewellyn ap Gruffith was married in Worcester Cathedral, uh, and both the uh, King of England and Alexander III, King of Scotland, attended that wedding. And so it, it's a kind of uh, a particular point in time when all, all three heads of states were at peace with one another uh, and in the same place at the same time. Now, Alexander the Third of Scotland had, in fact, married uh, Henry the Second. Excuse me, married Henry the Third's uh, daughter. That is to say, that the Scottish king uh, was married. Uh, by the time Edward the First comes to the throne, he was then married uh, to the sister of the English king. And, and so there's a real attempt to unite uh, Scotland and England in a kind of network of familial connections that would help maintain and sustain peace. This is a pretty usual way to try and maintain peace in the Middle Ages. Now, Scottish kings, uh, in theory at least, paid homage to the English king uh, 
uh, for their lands. But this was really only a symbolic uh, gesture, uh, acknowledging the uh, sort of greater might and uh, greater uh, financial, military, uh, and, uh, and other resources uh, that the English king had. The sort of Scottish kings, to maintain peace effectively, bent the knee as we would say in Game of Thrones terms. But in reality, the English kings didn't have uh, any effective authority in Scotland and, and uh, really certainly during Henry III's time wouldn't, dare, have, wouldn't have dared uh, attempt to cross in an armed fashion in Scottish territory. It was a very symbolic uh, homage that the Scottish kings gave to the English king. Now, of course, Henry III uh, pops his cogs in 1272, and Edward I comes to the throne, and he's a very different man from his father. Uh, Henry III had been a, a very religious king of England, uh, not very war-minded. Uh, the only serious war he'd been engaged in was against his own barons during the rebellion of Simon de Montfort, the so-called Barons' War of the uh, 1270s. And he'd really just uh, done what he could to maintain the peace between England, Wales, and Scotland. Now, Edward I, he grows up the son of a king. He lives the life of a kind of medieval uh, sort of playboy. He goes on crusade. He has big, large estates in France. He acts as an international mediator in various disputes. Uh, he's very much full of himself, uh, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I'd point out here that... Uh, uh, as I'll do several times through these lectures, the best general uh, introductory book to Edward I is Mark Morris's uh, biography of Edward I entitled A Great and Terrible King. Uh, terrible in the sense of fearful or frightful. Again, that's Mark Morris, uh, A Great and Terrible King. That's maybe not the most academic, but it's certainly engaging, and sometimes it's even a page-turner. So... This is the man on the English throne when in 1286, uh, just a couple of years after Edward I uh, subdues the last of the native Welsh princes, Alexander III of Scotland uh, dies with no heir. In fact, he, he actually dies in a tragic accident. Uh, he's on the east coast of Scotland riding along a kind of roadway overlooking the sea. It's getting dark. He, he's headed it, uh, south. He's headed in the direction of Edinburgh, effectively. Uh, and his horse slips over the cliff and he tumbles down into the sea and dies. And there's a, uh, actually a monument erected now, sort of stuck on the side of this uh, embankment. I think there's a picture of it on Wikipedia if you look up Alexander III. So he dies suddenly and with no heir. So six guardians are chosen by the uh, Scottish barons. And these six guardians uh, immediately recognize... Uh, Margaret, the so-called Maid of Norway, uh, as the heir to the throne of Scotland. While Alexander III uh, didn't have a son to inherit the throne, he had uh, produced a daughter, and she'd gone off and married the King of Norway, uh, and had herself had a daughter named Margaret. And so Margaret, the Maid of Norway, is in fact the granddaughter of Alexander III. So six guardians are going to look after the Scottish realm whilst uh, uh, the wee lass Margaret is shipped over from Norway uh, to be crowned uh, Queen of Scotland. But unfortunately, uh, Margaret dies on her way to Scotland and this raises a, a, a real crisis among the Scottish barons who ought best, uh, who ought best to be the next King of Scotland. Now in 1290, there are two uh, dominant candidates. Uh, Robert Bruce, uh, Robert. this is actually Robert Bruce the fifth Lord of Annandale. Uh, keep in mind that number fifth Lord of Annandale uh, because his, his grandson, the uh, seventh Lord of Annandale, would eventually emerge as a King of Scotland later. But for now, uh, these two candidates in 1290 are Robert Bruce the fifth uh, Lord of Annandale, and a man named John Balliol. Uh, 
who actually has some uh, Norman blood running in his veins and some estates over in France. Now, these two people both feel that they have a strong claim to the, the Scottish throne. Uh, in, in 1291, because they can't, uh, the Scottish barons can't decide between the two of them, they're concerned about a Scottish war. 1291, Edward, uh, King of England, is uh, brought into, onto the scene of Scotland to decide uh, to hold a kind of... Uh, intervention to act as an arbiter to decide who ought to have the throne of Scotland. Now Edward, he's, he's a little bit of a, a jerk about this. He he decides he's not just going to look at the claims of Bruce and Balliol, but in fact he's going to look at every possible claim to the throne of Scotland, uh, and even uh, throws his own hat into the ring as a potential king of Scotland. But uh, he uses that kind of as an excuse to sort of flag up his qualifications for the job as a, of a arbiter, uh, you know, that he, he does have some vague familial connections. And he actually goes through various claimants uh, until he whittles it down to the obvious uh, Bruce Balliol uh, contenders. And then he eventually uh, judges uh, in favor of John Balliol. Now, Balliol, he has all of the right... Uh, sort of heritage, familial connections, estates to be the King of Scotland. No, no one really questions that, except maybe the Bruce family. Uh, but what Bailey all had as a quality that Edward I particularly liked was that he effectively uh, was uh, very keen to cede a lot of uh, uh, a lot of his power to Edward I. He was more keen to acknowledge the the uh, uh, role of the King of England as a kind of overlord, uh, as a kind of overlord to uh, Scottish uh, affairs at Barons than the Bruce was. So John swears homage to Edward at Newcastle and becomes King of Scotland as a vassal of England. And Edward's really looking here to turn that kind of symbolic homage that the Scottish kings had given to the English king into something much more immediate, something that requires the Scots to sort of toe the line. We, you know, when the English ask for soldiers, for example, Edward thinks that the uh, Scottish king ought to cough up a little military aid whenever he likes. Now, this whole process of Edward getting involved and mediating and looking at the various claims, uh, this whole process of deciding who the next king of Scotland should be is referred to as the great cause. I mean, that's that's a, a phrase to write down that'll come up in various contexts if you uh, read around this topic. Uh, Edward's involvement in the so-called great cause has led historians to, to ask a lot of questions. Uh, what were Edward's motivations? Did did Edward uh, go up to Scotland as a well-meaning arbiter, or was he kind of waiting like a a, a cat waiting to pounce, you know, on an opportunity to uh, intervene in Scottish affairs and strengthen his own position relative to the new Scottish king? There are some other complicating factors here. Uh, Balliol and Bruce were both uh, major English landholders, and so. Uh, like a lot of these people with you know, Balliol, for example, with these Norman familial connections, over the years they'd purchased or been gifted or, or inherited lands on both sides of the border. And so both of these contenders had a lot to lose if they should go against the English king. Because, of course, the first thing that would happen, and indeed the first thing that does happen when Balliol falls foul of Edward I in a few years' time, is that the English king confiscates all of their property uh, on the English side of the border. So complex uh, networks of land and revenues are tied up here. Uh, Edward, uh, I know I've, uh, I've said a couple of times he, he acts as an arbiter because that's what he was invited there to do was to arbitrate between uh, Balliol and Bruce effectively. But Edward goes out of his way to refer to himself as a judge, to refer to what he's doing as passing judgment. And there's a big difference between 
uh, an arbiter and a judge. Of course, an arbiter listens to both sides and, and tries to sort of uh, get the two to reconcile and come to an agreement that's suitable to all parties. A judge uh, listens to all of the evidence and makes a judgment based on their own personal view on the right to the situation. Uh, to the winner go the spoils and to the loser uh, go the sour grapes in, in an instance of judgment. And so whilst the Scots may have invited Edward as an arbiter, uh, and in effect he was uh, doing the job of an arbiter between Bruce and Balliol, Edward refers to himself and what he's doing as a judge giving judgment. As I mentioned, he entertained all kinds of claims, uh, and the, the fact that he entertained, in fact, 14 claimants to the Scottish throne, uh, one of whom was himself, it suggests that maybe he was trying to kind of pounce on an opportunity to mix things up in Scottish politics and uh, and uh, increase his sway there. Uh, and the the last point I'd make here about the, the great cause in general is that in the end, uh, Balliol is chosen because according to the rules of primogeniture, by which uh, everything passes generationally, uh, to the oldest surviving son from generation to generation. Uh, it's, it's thought that, and of course that can get complicated, say if a son is dead, things might pass from a grandfather to a grandson. Uh, you know, all kinds of complications can arise. But based on this, this, this fundamental principle that everything passes to the oldest son, uh, Balliol is a, a judged, as Edward says, but uh, effectively is arbitrated to be the next king of Scotland. Now the reign of John Balliol doesn't last long, uh, less than four or four years. He's crowned at Scone, which is the, the traditional place of the crowning, crowning of Scottish kings uh, for at least a century before this. Uh, he's crowned at Scone on St. Andrew's Day, uh, 1292. He dutifully swears homage to King Edward I, but within months, uh, Edward is working to undermine uh, Scottish courts. O on the right here, you'll see a, a, a seal, a wax seal image of an enthroned uh, King John Balliol of Scotland. Uh, for example, when I mention Edward I undermining Scottish courts, uh, there's a dispute involving the Madcuff family of Fife. They get a judgment, the court of John Balliol. They don't like the result, so they uh, trundle down to England and say, well, uh, since we don't like the result of the Scottish king's court, and since you're the overlord to the Scottish king, if you'll hear this case and perhaps reconsider it, uh, you can overrule the king of Scotland as his liege lord. Now, this is something that uh, Edward I had done in cases from uh, Gascony and, and France, or cases from Wales in particular, to try and undermine uh, the Welsh princes. He'd gotten involved in this way, but never had an English king really dared to so obviously step in and overrule a Scottish king, put him in his place. Uh, Balliol's also uh, asked to serve in the uh, army of the English king. Uh, and in 1295, uh, on the back of a, uh, you know, the undermining of the Scottish king's courts, on the back of demands that uh, uh, Balliol uh, bring troops to serve for the English army, in 1295 an alliance is made between Balliol on behalf of the nation of Scotland and France, who is fixing to have a, a brief war uh, with the English just at that time. We, a war over the English king's possessions in France. So uh, basically, within four years, well, within three years, actually, we go from coronation of John Balliol to uh, really a complete falling out. On the back of this comes the so-called uh, First War of Scottish Independence. Uh, 1296, uh, knowing that uh, uh, an English invasion is inevitably going to come uh, in the future. The Scots uh, try and get a jump on this by crossing the border and attacking Carlisle, a walled and defended English city just south of the, the Solway and the west coast. Uh, 
The English, in turn, they sack Berwick on Tweed and crush the Scots at the Battle of Dunbar. Now, this is a, a set-piece pitched battle, something which generally doesn't happen much in the Middle Ages. Armies try very hard to avoid engaging in a, a, a sort of set-piece pitched battle because if you lose there, if you lose in that fashion, your army tends to be broke up, scattered, people are taken prisoner, and you're just crushed almost for a generation. Uh, and this is what happens uh, to the Scots when they uh, lose at Dunbar. John Balliol is eventually uh, captured. He's stripped of all of his royal garments, of his crown, and so forth. And in the wake of this resounding English victory, uh, 1,500 of the uh, most notable Scottish barons, uh, they swear loyalty to Edward I. Edward, uh, he marches as far north as Fife. Uh, he holds a parliament at Berwick. And at Berwick, this is where he takes the uh, oath of loyalty of these various Scottish barons who recognize his overlordship as King of Scotland after that uh, on a document that's called the, the Regman Roll, uh, which has a, an amazing survival of a historical document. It's hundreds of tiny seals uh, on the bits of uh, on little strips of ribbon hanging from the bottom of the document, so this seems a, a tremendous uh, reversal for the Scots. Uh, and it's almost a a mark of uh, seen as a mark of treachery by some that other individuals have have put their mark to the Ragman Roll, and a lot of the motivation to gravitate to Edward after the defeat of Balliol uh, is because at this time there still were a lot of Scots who, like the Balliol and Bruce families, had property on both sides of the border, and they didn't dare cross Edward for fear that they would lose half their estates, say, on the English side of the border. The so-called Stone of uh, Scone is taken by Edward. This is a stone on which you, the uh, Scottish kings uh, were crowned uh, you know, for the previous hundred years or more. Uh, sometimes called the Stone of Destiny. It's taken back uh, to Westminster where it's it's put in the bottom of a chair, actually. It's that uh, chair on the first slide of this uh, PowerPoint. I'd, I'd encourage you to go back and uh, look at the opening image. And of course, uh, the Royal Archives have taken the, the Black uh, Rue de St. Margaret, a kind of famous religious uh, icon, is, is taken. So these kind of markers of independence and state are confiscated by Edward. In fact, Edward had done the same thing uh, in Wales after he'd defeated the Prince of Wales, Llorna Gruffith. He'd taken uh, the, effectively the crown jewels of Wales uh, as well. English administration is imposed, uh, and there's some alterations to Scottish law to bring certain things in line with English law. Now, the Scottish responses from uh, 1297 are mixed. Uh, there are questions in people mo people's minds about uh, what does it mean to be a Scot? Uh, you know, what does this say about Scottish identity? Uh, there are some local uprisings and local resistance. You know, it's, it's confusion effectively. This is a kind of period in time in which uh, uh, nationalism and a sense of nation is is just emerging across much of Western Europe. And this is an event that, that helps in a lot of ways forge a sense of Scottish identity. Now, because the barons don't, the Scottish barons don't act, it, it leaves a kind of opening from a minor, uh, a man from a minor knightly family, William Wallace, uh, and uh, another chap named of the same kind of minor noble class, Andrew Murray, who uh, is kind of forgotten in the Hollywood uh, film. Uh, to work together to lead what, what genuinely becomes a, qu quite a populist revolt against English rule. And they draw some, some uh, aristocratic support. And of course, as soon as, uh, as a noble, as soon as you come out on the side of the rebels, your lands in England are confiscated. And so over the course of this and succeeding period, there's a kind of separation of uh, Scotland and England in, in terms of these uh, families are all forced to pick one side or another is your allegiance with the rebels in Scotland or with the King of England, and whichever way you leap, your land on the other side of the border is confiscated. But that actually creates a, uh, 
kind of long-term separation of the nobilities of Scotland and England. Uh, this culminates uh, with the Battle of Stirling in 1297. There's an image here of uh, Stirling Bridge. This is, this is a modern bridge. It's not the medieval bridge, of course. Uh, but contrary to the, the kind of Braveheart film, a battle takes place in Stirling Bridge, which has a lot of boggy ground uh, uh, along either side of it. Uh, the English try to rely on their kind of trusted heavy cavalry charge like uh, their Norman ancestors have been using for ages, but they, they can't stack the horses onto the bridge in sufficient numbers or breath to be able to force their way across. And it, it becomes a bit of a bloodbath uh, because they continue to try and fight their way across this bridge that the Scots hold with a, a numerically inferior force. Uh, so this leads to a great victory for Wallace that catapults him to, to fame as a leader of the Scottish resistance. Uh, Wallace is, is named uh, protector of the realm in Scotland, uh, really uh, by a reluctant nobility that kind of have to recognize that the country is now in open warfare with the English. Now, Wallace is, is nothing at all like in the absolutely dreadful Braveheart film 1995. Uh, that film kind of picks up on the, the myth of Wallace, which is something that, again, uh, takes on a life of its own after a long period of time. So in 1477, there's an epic poem written by Harry the Minstrel, some called blind, sometimes called Blind Harry, uh, that sort of says he's, he creates a, an image of a bigger than life man, you know, uh, who's leading kind of righteous, godly Scots against godless English. In reality, it's 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 nothing near uh, like that. Uh, as a military leader, he's in the kind of no surrender camp, uh, Wallace. But that's because he's a, a populist leader uh, rather than a, a political uh, leader in the, in the sense that. The nobility are who are always looking for negotiated peace and, and jockeying for position. Almost nothing in the Braveheart film is accurate or real. Uh, for example, in the Braveheart film, it has Mel Gibson fathering a child with the uh, wife of Edward the First, son Edward the uh, Second. Well, actually, uh, Isabella of France. She was actually three years old. Uh, and in France at the time, if that gives you any sense of how ridiculous the movie is. It's, it's the worst kind of, of, of populist tripe. Uh, at any rate, I don't want to drone on about that anymore. I'll, I'll have a, a kind of a, a real stress if I were to try and enumerate all the, all the terrible inaccuracies in that film. Uh, but Wallace is a real person, and he is a populist uh, leader. Now, this necessitates a, a second uh, English war against the, in, against the Scots, uh, which comes to fruition for the English in 1298, when another army goes up to Scotland uh, and achieves victory over the Scots at the Battle of Falkirk. Now, Wallace is a, a co-conspirator or co-leader uh, of the more popular Scottish rebellion, a Murray, uh, he dies and leaves Scotland uh, to uh, lead the kind of populist rebellion on his own. In fact, in fact uh, Wallace, he takes flight uh, at first. Uh, in 1305, uh, ordinances are passed by the King of England which systematically look at Scottish law, try and amend them and update them in a really full and full on forceful fashion. Uh, to reform them as he sees it to be uh, better, more like English common law. This is the same thing that he'd done in Wales with the Statute of Wales back in 1284. Wallace is, uh, of course, eventually captured, and he is genuinely hung, drawn, and quartered with his uh, uh, disconnected limbs sent to the various parts of the realm and his, his head put on, on a pike down at London. Uh, this uh, image at the right is thought to be a portrait of Edward I, and it's at Westminster Abbey in London. Now, Robert Bruce, uh, this is Robert Bruce, the seventh uh, Lord of Annandale. He 
Uh, he comes to the fore now. This is the grandson of Robert Bruce uh, V, Lord of Annandale, who had been a contender for the throne uh, back in 1296. Now, he's crowned king uh, in 1306. And uh, I give you here a couple of good authors to check with here. Uh, G. Barrow, uh, he refers to this as a kind of re proper revival of Scottish kingship on the back of uh, years of anarchy and populist rebellion. Uh, Adrian Beryl here, who of course has written the uh, the uh, what are the textbooks I suggest for this course, uh, a book called Disunited Kingdoms. Uh, he says that this effectively is part of a continuing era of civil war between Scots that are happy to settle uh, with English domination and Scots that aren't happy to settle with English domination. Uh, and, and he, of course, has a, 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 uh, a rival for his claim to the throne as well. Uh, the Balliol family is long since uh, out of the picture. And in fact, old, old uh, dethroned John Balliol ends up living on his ancestral Norman family estates back in uh, France. Uh, Robert Bruce, the seventh Lord of uh, Annadale, or the Robert I of Scotland, as he would be after he's crowned, uh, he has a rival in the form of the Cummins family, which again is a, a rival noble family in Scotland. Now, fortunately for him, Edward I uh, pops his cogs uh, in 1307. Actually, he dies not far from Car Carlisle, Carlisle uh, leading an army up to fight the Scots yet again. His son, Edward II, inherits huge debts from his father's wars. Edward I had started borrowing money from Italian bankers as a novel way of funding uh, the war against the Welsh back in the uh, 1270s and 80s. He'd expelled the Jewish community from England and confiscated their property to try and raise money. Uh, he'd spent even more uh, money borrowed again from Italian bankers to go to war in Scotland. And so his son, Edward II, comes to the throne, a man who's not particularly adept at leadership or, or uh, war fighting, uh, and at the same time, he's saddled with huge debts. He, he also suffers accusations of favoritism. There's a man named Piers Gaveston, who he, he makes, uh, who he effectively gifts Cornwall to at one point, uh, who is French uh, in birth and rearing. Uh, who some claim is his uh, lover. There are always there are some claims that Edward II might have been gay. Nobody really knows. But this ja Gaveston chap who's perceived to be a recipient of far too much uh, free land and favors from Edward II becomes a kind of focal point of anger and resistance. Uh, Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, and other major nobles uh, for a period managed to completely in completely incapacitate Edward's rule and effectively uh, uh, rule in his name almost. Edward eventually wrests back control uh, from his own barons, but he only fights one major campaign uh, against the Scots in the entire period 1307 to 1314. On the 24th of June, he trundles up the Bannockburn, uh, in 1314, and he's uh, roundly defeated uh, by the Scots. This leads to a long period of border raids. Uh, Ralph Griffiths referred to, refers to this period as a sad catalog of invasion, border raids, and unstable occupation of the southern uh, shires of Scotland uh, by the English, whilst the Scots fight back. Uh, why does it last so long? Why is there so much miserable toing and froing across the border with uh, occasional English occupation? For example, the uh, barrack on Tweed is occupied with English uh, in indefinitely, but the Scots come down and raid around Carlisle and the south side of the Solway. Well, it lasts so long because there's no real knockout blow. Uh, uh, Bannockburn had, had been a great victory for the Scots, but it didn't it didn't knock out the English war machine. Scotland's size and its distance from York, uh, York being the nearest kind of major city from which any jumping off, which could serve as a jumping off point for a campaign against the Scots, 
uh, its distance from York even made supplying troops in Scotland difficult, if not impossible. There's no money to pay soldiers because the country, because England's in debt terribly. And there are all kinds of distractions. There's rebellion in Wales in uh, uh, 1316, the rebellion of Clwyd and Bren, which necessitates uh, sending troops to Wales. There's intermittent war with France over uh, England's possessions in, in France, Gascony in particular. Edward II has various problems at home. Uh, you know, he, he can't protect the north of England, and so his own northern barons are reluctant to pay taxes, and so he, that hamstrings him from raising money to go raise an army to head north, fight the Scots, and defend them. So it's a kind of vicious circle. 1321 to 22, Edward turns on his magnates and captures his chief rival, uh, Thomas of Lancaster, uh, in a, show, in a show of force, uh, it's nearly civil war in England. That's how bad it is. In 1326, uh, Edward, in turn, is captured by his own magnates. Uh, his own estranged wife, who had years before taken their uh, son, the future Edward III, over to Paris with her. She, of course, was a daughter of the French king. She comes from France uh, together with her lover, uh, a chap named Mortimer. Uh, who is a great estate holder in the March of Wales. She, her lover, and their child son, the future Edward III, come over from France. London declares in favor of them. Edward II's own magnates capture him, uh, and Edward III is appointed king in May 1327. Uh, Edward II, of course, will be taken to Barclay Castle, uh, just on the east side of the River Severn, where he's held captive uh, and eventually... Uh, it's thought executed. So how does Scotland fare in, the, fare in this period? Well, uh, ideas of Scottish sovereignty and national identity emerge out of this crisis. England may be the superior military power uh, and the, the Scots may suffer from a variety of rival claimants in infighting but that doesn't stop the sort of long-term cultural trend of emergent Scottish identity uh, that comes out of the kind of shared experience of suffering at the hands of occasional English military intrusion. In 1328, a peace uh, is made between the uh, a child in the name of the child king of England, Edward III, uh, and the king of Scotland. Robert the First. Uh, that's Robert Bruce, seventh Lord Annandale. I'll give you an example here of uh, the evidence that's been put forward for the emergent uh, sense of Scottish nationality that comes out of this period. Uh, that's a, this is a so-called Declaration of Ar Arbroath of 1320. It's often uh, quoted. You'll see again uh, as you have on the, the Regman roll, you'll see in the bottom of the Declaration of Arbroath these long uh, strips of parchment, the seals of the various nobles who'd put their names to it. Uh, as it says here, these Scottish nobles claimed, for as long as a hundred of us remain alive, we will never on any condition be subject to the lordship of the English, for we fight not for glory, nor riches, nor honors, but for freedom alone, which no man gives up except with his life. And this is a, a statement from Scottish barons, but it kind of reflects a, a pan-European growth of national consciousness in the late 13th and early 14th century. This is really the sense in which uh, we see the early roots of what we would now call nations forming up. 